Good afternoon. Welcome to a special edition of Citizen Live at One. I am Anne Kikuta. Our eyes are trained at the International Criminal Court, where the court has taken a 30-minute recess um, in the proceedings against Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta. They are at a status conference today where they're discussing cooperation uh, between Kenya and the ICC and how Uhuru Kenyatta figures into that conversation. We want to show you pictures of uh, Uhuru Kenyatta's arrival at the court early this morning before those proceedings began. He was received uh, by various Kenyan leaders uh, who had traveled to the Hague-based court to show their solidarity with the president. He did not address uh, journalists at that point, and neither has he spoken uh, during the status conference, saying that he has deferred that right to his lawyers. Those pictures from earlier this morning as Uhuru Kenyatta made his way to the court. Joining me now in studio to discuss the first part the first part of that session is uh, Evans Monari. We'll be speaking to him shortly. Uh, to receive uh, Uhuru Kenyatta there. I can see him now. Already you can see such commotion now as he comes in. And we're going to try and get a word from him. smiling in as he as I had intimated earlier, we'll be joined by Evans Monari, who is a senior counsel and one who has actually practiced at this court, uh, acted for Major General Hussein Ali. He'll be giving us analysis uh, shortly. But first, let's listen to part of the proceedings today as uh, the prosecutor, Benjamin Gumpert, put forward his argument that the prosecution needs more time in order to be able to get the requisite amount of evidence they need to proceed with this case and saying that they do not know how much time this may be. It may be, in fact, up until the next general election in Kenya. Listen. There's a bigger lever in moving the position of the government of Kenya that the prosecution asked for an indefinite adjournment. It is to prevent the injustice which I say would be represented by a decision not to grant an adjournment which I expanded upon in my answer to His Honour Judge Henderson just a moment ago. Uh, it is that injustice which I say can only properly be avoided by the grant Director, of an indefinite I'm adjournment. It has to be, or I submit, it can only practicably, reasonably be indefinite because we have run out of hooks on which we can hang any particular date. Uh, in answer to, uh, uh, to Her Honour Judge Azaki, uh, I suggested, not entirely seriously, in respect of all of the various dates which we could consider, 
I think implicit in her question was to find out the date on which the Assembly of States parties will consider this matter, if there is a referral, and make that the terminating date. Uh, I suggested the date of the next general election in Kenya. But all of these dates uh, are not going to provide any realistic greater prospect of what we would say is ultimate compliance with the government of Kenya's treaty obligations. The only realistic uh, end point, it isn't an end point, the, end, the only realistic order to make if the court is minded to adjourn, is to say, we don't know when this case may resume but we believe that justice demands that it shouldn't be terminated now on these conditions in the light of this obstruction, if that is the finding you make. And therefore, the only realistic order we can make is to adjourn the case without fixing a date. There may come a time during the future, who knows when it will be, when this court, you three judges remaining seized of this matter, will say, I know not in five years' time, whenever, enough's enough. But I would respectfully submit that whilst this continuing uh, failure on the part of the government of Kenya uh, is still fresh, and while this accused person is still the head of that government, that day will not come. And to my second and the last question for the moment, All right, um, that being uh, the lawyer for the prosecution, Benjamin Gumpert, uh, Monari joins me now. And in my own lay understanding of the proceedings today, the court seemed particularly interested uh, in two things. One, the rights of the accused person and how, you know, staying this particular process may uh, infringe on his rights uh, for due process. And th there was the argument by uh, various uh, lawyers, uh, the, the OTP, and of course that of the victims, that sh the court should not entirely drop this case uh, because, as the victims' lawyers put it, this may prejudice uh, their position. They do not know whether the office of the prosecutor will, in fact, return to this case or will choose lighter matters. Tell us what your understanding was of the um, deliberations between staying um, this particular case, going for an indefinite adjournment, and vis-a-vis -vis the court making a decision and saying, you know, let's drop this altogether, and the prosecution is welcome to come back to the court at a later date and institute fresh charges altogether. First of all, let me say that uh, <coughs> excuse me, there's no provision for uh, an adjournment that is indefinite. What the prosecutor would do is withdraw the charges, investigate, and at a future point, uh, bring back the charges, which then has to go through the confirmation uh, stages until where we are now. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that we safeguard the rights of the accused persons, witnesses, and the victims. But what we have observed in the last hour yeah. I, 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 is, is one of those moments that uh, you just say, poor me, prosecutor. Benjamin Gumpert is at pains to say, I don't want to go on with this case. He joined the, the, the court late. He was not there from the beginning. Uh, but the people who are there from the beginning, that is Ben Suda and uh, the, the, the other prosecutor from Nigeria, are sitting down pretty and seeing him being roasted by the judges, and he does not have the exact answers that the judges need. And that is, we want to be able to uh, dismiss this case at this stage. What, what are the authorities that you have? He doesn't have any to support his own ground. He's being a very honest prosecutor up to that point. He also says he does not even have legal provisions for the, the case that he's urging in court. Under the circumstances, I don't see why this matter should continue, because there's that admission by the prosecutor that they do not have the evidence, the law does not support them, and there's no jurisprudence to back up what they want. But part of his argument was also that, uh, number one, this is an extraordinary proceeding, so he may not be able to quote cases, um, you know, international cases that, that, that would make, he'd make reference to, and also that uh, while the court has different rights to to balance on that the rights of the accused should not supersede the court's determination to actually get justice. I, I agree with you that uh, there may be no precedent to support the assertions that are being made in court now, 
but we have got the, the wrong statute and its procedures. If there is no evidence, even in a magistrate's court here, the, 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 the thing that the prosecutor does, using what we call prosecutorial integrity, is to on, honorably withdraw the charges and try another day, if it is possible. All right, we'll come back to our conversation uh, with Monari as we analyze um, this particular story. We want to move to something that is related. And uh, on his uh, day two as acting president, William Ruto is currently officiating at the launch of a campaign dubbed Magical Kenya that seeks to lure back tourists and market Kenya as a favorite destination. Willis Raburu now joins us live from KICC. Uh, Willis, uh, bring us up to speed. What's the latest there? Thank you very much, uh, and back uh, in studio. But of course, uh, let me begin by saying the second day as acting president uh, of, of acting president William Ruto began at the Crown Plaza, where he attended the economic delivery unit uh, meeting there. But it's also important to note that uh, Kenya was supposed to be represented at its highest level in Uganda uh, at the infrastructure summit. But of course, uh, the acting president did not go there. Remember, over the and over the entire period of two days, we have been talking about what he can and what he cannot do. Uh, so he, did not, he wasn't able to attend. He instead chose to attend the two meetings he did today. That is the one at Kamaraza and now this one, the Kenya Expo. And his talk has been uh, all based and geared towards uh, improving Kenya's economic uh, status and, of course, putting mo more money in the hands of the Kenyans and building us into the digit e economy and and also he will have some more meetings later on in the afternoon but maybe just of interest uh, uh, to the Kenyan populace would be that we have been saying that uh, one uh, the acting president has an aide de camp so that shows that he is not uh, uh, acting in the capacity of command in chief two normally you will notice that what happens uh, whenever the the president uh, and the deputy president were in a function. The president's podium would clearly be marked president of Kenya, and that of the deputy president would be marked, have the seal rather of the president of Kenya, and that of the deputy president would be clearly marked Republic of Kenya. He is still using uh, the Republic of Kenya seal, even in his acting capacity as president. From here on, he will have several other uh, meetings. It's going to be a, a bit of a slow day. But then he'll have a few more meetings and we'll be able to tell our viewers about it in our subsequent, uh, subsequent meetings. And also, of course, on our Twitter handles at Citizen TV News and at Citizen TV Kenya. For now, though, from here at the Magical Expo, which he has just uh, spoken, we're just waiting for him to come. Some of the cabinet secretaries have already uh, begun leaving the venue, so he's also expected to leave uh, in just a few minutes and head on to his other meetings. Uh, so from here, for me, Willis Oburu, it's back to you and it's suited to continue with the rest of the rest. Thanks very much, uh, Willis Raburu. There, for us, we want to return to the question of the ICC and the proceedings that have been on uh, in the past few minutes over the last hour or so. Evans Monari stays with me, senior counsel. You know, part of the conversation um, that took place there was the question of whether or not Uhuru Kenyatta, in his capacity as president of the Republic of Kenya, has used that position to affect cooperation between um, the, the Office of the Prosecutor and the Kenya government. And both the prosecution and the, um, the uh, victim's lawyers agreed that there is no evidence to the same, but both still maintained that they are in fact, you know, waiting, they, they do need more time to be able to prove whether such a thing has taken place at all, or to be able to collect other evidence in the case. So what's the import of the fact that they agree on one thing? They do not have evidence that Uhuru Kenyatta has interfered. And that is very important because Gaynor and Gumpert both say that they have no evidence of any tampering with the evidence or uh, obstruction by Uhuru Kenyatta in terms of providing the evidence that is required. Uh, Stephen Kay on the other side says that there, there, there has been compliance because a lot of documentation has been given to the, to the prosecutor. What is more interesting is that the prosecutor is saying that even with the documents that he has been given to date, there's no evidence that can uh, uh, allow him to proceed with the prosecution. He also further says that even the documentation that he's expecting uh, or hopes to get, he does not know whether that 
because the documentation has got any evidence against Uhuru Kenyatta. To me, that is a pointer that the judges should uh, take a view, and that view is uh, you don't have evidence. Let us just dismiss this thing or even into it. And can we have that decision made today? I, I, I doubt they could make a decision today, but I doubt that that will be made. We'll know in a short while. They may just delay so they can give a considered opinion uh, in a few days' time. Uh, but they could indicate so. But I doubt that, that that has not happened before. After a status conference, they wait for a, 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 a long, a, a short while. Okay. What is more telling is what the victim's lawyer said. He said, if you are going to uh, dismiss this case, or, 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 or if it is withdrawn and just to be uh, referred to the state parties, it is really an admission. He's preparing his clients that this matter may go to the state parties under the treaty, that it may not be going on. And I think he's being clever there, he's being psychologically clever, preparing the victims that, uh, listen, this matter may not go on. Even I don't have evidence that can show that there's been any tampering or obstruction. Uh, we don't know whether we'll get a lesser case, but gosh, this one is gone. <laughs> well, like Lisa, that, that, that would be your considered view on the same. We want to cross over to the ICC where Francis Gashuri is standing by. Uh, Gashuri, I, I apologize. I think it's, it may be pouring where you're at. Bring us up to speed. What's going on? What, what are the views of those perhaps that you've been able to speak to so far on the first part of proceedings at the court? Thank you very much and a good afternoon to you. And Kiguta, indeed, a very long day here at The Hague. But... Uh, uh, also, very interesting discussions going on inside the courtroom, and of course the weather, as you can see, uh, turning awful, uh, very windy and very rainy. But, however, the temperatures out here do not compare in any way uh, with the temperatures inside the courtroom, uh, because it's a legal showdown between the defense team, uh, the prosecution, and the legal representative for the victims, uh, in this case that is uh, touching on uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. And, uh, and by now, I'm sure our viewers have realized that um, uh, the transmission that is coming to them has a 30 minutes delay, and uh, the break that the uh, trial chamber uh, allowed uh, for, uh, or, the, or the adjournment that the trial chamber allowed for about 30 minutes has since lapsed, and the session is going on uh, as we speak real time uh, here at the Hague. Uh, they, 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 have, they have gone back to session, and uh, it's expected that the session is going to uh, take about an hour, uh, and uh, uh, Stephen K, uh, Uhuru's lead defense uh, lawyer, uh, has uh, taken uh, the stand uh, to explain why he thinks the case uh, should be uh, called off immediately or the charges should be withdrawn forthwith, uh, and of course uh, asking the uh, trial chamber uh, to ignore or, or to decline uh, the prosecution's request for indefinite adjournment of the case. Uh, to allow uh, the prosecution team to look for more evidence to sustain the charges uh, the prosecution has leveled against uh, Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta. And of course, each of the uh, parties in this uh, matter will be given an opportunity, about 10 minutes or so, uh, to respond uh, before the judges can uh, have a final determination of the matter. So basically, uh, Anne, the contest uh, simply is that of uh, the prosecution asking for more time uh, and an ind 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 indefinite adjournment of the trial and more time to look for evidence versus uh, the defense team's uh, proposal that the charges be withdrawn forthwith uh, without any condition. And of course, as we have always said, uh, the verdict uh, lies squarely with the three judges uh, led by Justice Kuniko Ozaki. Back to you, and and uh, shortly our viewers will be able to uh, watch, uh, of course, a delayed version of the proceedings that are ongoing in Courtroom 1 here yeah. at The Hague. Back to you, Anne. Thanks, Kishori, uh, for that. You know, part of the con uh, con uh, uh, text, sorry, my English is getting lost there, <laughs> context that is ongoing is what you had referred to earlier, which is what can the Assembly of State Parties do in as far as this case is concerned, if, should it be referred um, there because of a lack of cooperation. But the victim's lawyer uh, said that it is the accused person, Uhuru Kenyatta, who by virtue of the office that he holds as president, who has created the delay by inaction, and he can, quote, end this at any point by directing the Attorney General to comply. He has wavered his right to have an expeditious trial 
um, by his failure to, you know, issue any um, specific direction as President of the Republic of Kenya to the Office of the Attorney General to comply uh, with what the court wants. So what did you make of that view? Uh, Mr. Gaynor forgets that we have laws in Kenya and that we have a constitution in Kenya, which provides that uh, there are state institutions that do certain things. The president cannot direct the state institutions or the persons that have been are in cabinet to do certain things. That is not possible. And also there are laws, or privacy laws, there are laws that, uh, procedures that have got to be used, and that is what the Attorney General was at pains to explain to the court yesterday, that yes, we can, we can give you this, but it, it is not specific. If, if you want me to tell you this and this and that, you must be specific as well. But there are certain things I cannot give you as because of the operation of the law. And that's, that, is, that is a real uh, problem with the, the victim's lawyer. He sees Uhuru Kenyatta like uh, uh, some sort of Gagenton uh, president who can do anything within a very short time. That's not the case for Kenya. Where, wh what is your answer to the question uh, that the judges posed? Um, can the Assembly of State Parties resolve the impasse that, is, that stands between the Office of the Prosecutor and the Attorney General? Certainly, the, the, the state parties can. They are the political wing of the court, and that's why the reference is being made to them. Yes, sir. through what action? Uh, it, can, it, can, it's, it will resolve it politically. It is a political decision that will be made there. The, because now the country will be able to explain why it cannot get this documentation. You know, here now we are dealing with a court situation. It's a, it's, it's a back and forth answer between the judges and the parties. But in the state parties, we will, we will be discussing it and there will be back and forth trading of issues. And if you can do this, then we can grant you this. Whereas in the court, there's no cost trading. Okay. Yeah. Uh, once a determination is made by the judges, um, and, and this may be a bit of an unfair question, but once one is made, how soon do you think, should they determine, let's refer this to the Assembly of State Parties, would that conversation begin within the ASB? Uh, now, that's, as I said, it's a political question. Yeah. It depends on uh, how, how quickly the state parties get together. And they also have an agenda. They could fix it for a time when they already have uh, fixed meetings for other issues. They could call a special session. Mm -hmm. It is all depends on the, the program of the state parties. You know, the question of the, 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 the timeliness, if you like, or um, uh, expeditiousness of this process has been brought up in reference to does it prejudice Uhuru Kenyatta? Is it fair to him? And, and basically, uh, the passage that I read earlier was the victim's lawyer saying, no, it doesn't, because he could have acted. He could, there's something, they imagine there's something he could have done to speed this along. Um, but does it prejudice the position of victims in this case? No, it does not, uh, does not do so at all. This court can still, uh, the, the prosecutor can still investigate and charge uh, either Mr. Kenyatta Fresh or other people. So the victims they still have a chance, but one pities them because it's taking a long time, and, uh, and, and that also is not uh, fair on them, the fact that it's taking a long time. Okay. Yeah. Explain to us what we should expect uh, once the court, well, we know it's back in session, but once we have that link, what should we anticipate now? Um, as I said, is any of the three, the withdrawal is not there now by the prosecutor. They've, they've indicated so. So it's, it's either a dismissal of the charges or a referral to the state parties. All right, we're, we're going to return uh, with our commentary with uh, Evans Monari, should time allow. But let's move on with uh, other stories that we're covering for you on Citizen Live at One. Political parties whose members engage in violence risk uh, deregistration. A meeting between the Registrar of Political Parties, Lucien Domo, and officials of various parties resolved that punitive measures be taken against groups and individuals who engage in acts of intolerance. That which has been witnessed in various parts of the country, which has brought us together today to address this issue and tell Kenyans that we, as political parties, we abhor violence.
Well, the meeting scheduled to take place today between the Machakos Governor Alfred Mutua, Kitui Governor Julius Malombe, and their Makwenye counterpart, Kivula Kibwana, is yet to kick off. The meeting is aimed at finding a solution to the leadership wrangles in Makwenye County. The frosty relations between the county government and the assembly have been a matter of major concern. Two weeks ago, five people were injured during a clash between the governor's supporters and the police as they tried to gain entry to a meeting held by the county assembly members. The impasse is said to be an impediment to development in the county. Well, two dormitories at Maralal Boys High School in Samburu County were last night destroyed in a fierce fire. There were no injuries reported, although belongings of more than 100 students were reduced to ashes. Most of those affected by the fire that broke out while the students were in their classrooms are from those who are set to sit for their national examinations next month. Red Cross officials said they will assist the students to enable them prepare for the examinations. According to the area police commandant Patrick Kambani, the cause of their fire is yet to be established. I wish to reassure the students that the security will be beefed up, investigations carried out, and if there is any foul play, uh, we shall have to establish. Safi Godan, Citizen Live at one. The county government of Moranga has promised to boost clay and pottery sand mining as uh, another venture to generate more revenue. This move comes after clay miners complained of exploitation by businessmen, which might eventually render them jobless. Tom Monjala tells us more. It is a business that has been conducted for many years by Muranga people. Energy conserving chicos, pots and ceramic products being the items commonly sold in the Juakali stalls in Muranga County. But before getting these final products, the hassle of getting clay soil is not a walk in the park. Clay soil miners claim that they do not benefit much from this activity that has been practiced for a very long time. Hizi dio tunau tunasia wale watu wana wanaenda huko tengeleza nyungu ama majiko alafu ile bei tuna kuanzia sio tipei kali we apologize we're going to have to cut that report short because proceedings are back at the international criminal court let's go live there